just a little bit about Professor Wargo. He's a professor of environmental risk analysis and policy at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He's also a professor of political science and the director of the environmental, excuse me, the Environment and Health Initiative. His recent work is, on, is focusing on children's exposure to air pollution, especially diesel, diesel emissions. You know our and uh, he received his degrees from the University of Pennsylvania, and he's an alum of Yale. He's gotten his master's and also his doctorate from Yale University. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm very excited about learning about the impact of the environment on our life. So with, with, would you please welcome me, excuse me, welcome John, together with me, to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. And uh, there's a, a brief uh, ceremony that we'll uh, engage in now. There's a gift for you. As I Hi, everybody. I'm Tom DeAndrea from the Children's Center. And I, I'm here to thank Dr. Anissa Ramirez for her wonderful efforts at promoting the, uh, the importance of science to young children. Um, my students were very impressed by your contributions, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, they really admire you for your efforts and your commitment to children. Yes, there is the world of sports. Yes, there is the world of boys. And there is the world of fashion. But there's also the wonderful world of ideas and science and discovery. And you've made a great contribution to that. And my girls really want to thank you. And my boys want to thank you. And Kayla, who's our superstar, she has a little something to thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll start in. Thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning. And uh, I thought that uh, what I would do would be to share with you the types of research questions that I am interested in, and also to give you uh, my sense of uh, what's worth worrying about with respect to the environment and human health. Uh, it's a complicated issue, and, and uh, every day in the New York Times or whatever uh, media you, uh, you uh, uh, look at, you, you find competing claims of, of uh, 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 what's worth worrying about. Uh, so I'm selecting several cases uh, that I've worked on during my career. Uh, and these involve land, uh, food, uh, water, and air, and uh, the threats that are associated with especially contaminants in those different uh, environmental media. So <clears throat> my machine was locking up there. I wanted to start by uh, uh, giving you my idea that environmental law uh, has become very complicated during the past three or four decades. And since 1960, we have uh, more than three dozen federal statutes and uh, many mirror images of those statutes at, at the state governmental le level. I'm not going to talk about all these laws. Uh, but I want to raise the question in your mind whether or not these laws have been effective in making uh, environmental quality higher or better. And I'll be talking uh, about uh, several of these laws, especially the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the Superfund law that is designed to control uh, the cleanup of hazardous facilities, uh, also the federal insecticide statute, uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Uh, so I'm going to concentrate uh, on four cases that deal with land, with, with water, uh, with food, and then with air. And my research also is focused on the special risks faced by kids uh, in pregnant women. And uh, the uh, uh, reason for that is that uh, children are often uh, much more vulnerable to a variety of environmental contaminants than adults are. And by the way, the, uh, the, the definition of a child uh, in, uh, <coughs> in the pediatric world now, uh, it ends at, at uh, the age 21. Uh, and there's some evidence that uh, the full development of neural architecture uh, doesn't conclude uh, for some until the early 20s. Uh, so during periods of rapid growth and development of uh, organ systems uh, and cells, uh, these may be periods of time when uh, people, uh, our youngest, are most susceptible to some damage. Uh, kids also uh, behave differently than adults do or, or uh, <coughs> the elderly. And their patterns of behavior cause them to be exposed to chemicals in very different ways. Uh, so that a, a, a toddler, for example, crawling on the floor 
uh, a toddler picking up things from the floor so that their hand and mouth behavior can transfer chemicals uh, that make their way down to the floor or are deliberately applied to the floor, such as indoor application of pesticides, uh, so that the pattern of exposure is not uniform across the population. So I'm really interested in these, uh, these problems where the contamination or the exposure is, is uh, not uniform, that it's quite variable. And then in my research, I wonder whether or not law has the capacity to uh, uh, direct government to identify this distributional pattern. I think about it as pockets of high risk out there or high contamination that could be defined by uh, the location of pollution, but also could be defined by this issue of variable susceptibility that I just mentioned. Uh, susceptibility isn't just uh, uh, a term to describe children, but it could describe the elderly, it could uh, describe certain people uh, that uh, are, are genetically uh, more prone to illness, uh, or uh, they may be defined uh, uh, by their inability to cope with these problems. In other words, uh, the wealthiest are in many ways uh, the most capable of managing risky situations through insurance or access to good health care. Uh, so if you think about uh, uh, where these problems are worst in the world or in the United States, uh, I think it's important to think about uh, uh, the kind of, of, of ways that uh, different groups have to, to manage risk and, and to manage health. Uh, there's a whole body of law as well to deal with management of land, especially federal land, and I won't be talking about that, other than to say that uh, the whole area of environmental health as it's evolved in our legal system has <coughs> uh, really been quite uh, distinct uh, from the management of land. Uh, and I'm curious about that because I think that the, the, the way we manage land has terrific implications for how we're exposed to chemicals in our environment uh, and the way that we, we uh, <coughs> uh, control land use in particular. Uh, the location of different facilities such as uh, uh, water supply lines or transportation networks, uh, these have terrific implications for future growth patterns uh, as well as patterns of, of contamination associated with, with uh, uh, higher density populations. I'll ma mention uh, uh, several other statutes just at the beginning here because I think these laws are extremely important to managing environmental quality and managing human health, but most people don't think about it like that. These are statutes that have evolved to control ownership of information. Uh, who owns knowledge of, of risk? Who's got the, who has the right uh, to keep information secret? Well, the government does under certain circumstances uh, so that uh, you know, our, our, our uh, more current concerns about homeland security and managing terrorist threats uh, is, is believed to justify government uh, classifying some information as, as secret. Uh, but there's also uh, patent law uh, governing uh, trade secrecy uh, that allows the private sector to uh, not disclose certain ingredients in, in foods or in, in other products. Uh, one example of that would be artificial ingredients. Uh, <clears throat> so artificial uh, flavors is an example. They're not required to be listed uh, on food products. And you have no right to, to uh, get access to those ingredients. I have a daughter who has a very severe allergic reaction to an artificial grape flavor. Uh, and as an example of that, we have a really hard time in our family trying to figure out what foods might have that flavor in it. And the law that uh, protects uh, the full disclosure of these ingredients uh, can be a problem. So uh, when you think about environmental law, you might think about the, the traditional pollution statutes, uh, but keep in mind the land and resource management statutes, and then this third body of law, which I think is very important, uh, that governs your right to get access to information. So what's your right to know? Well, it's actually pretty complicated, uh, and it allows a lot of decisions uh, to be made about uh, environmental uh, management that uh, uh, do not demand full disclosure. I'm going to jump across a couple of sites here, uh, or slides here, so that I can move ahead and, and uh, uh, share these cases with you. Uh, I'll give you one example of, of the land management problem that we face and, and my perception of the scale of the problem. Uh, we have a law called the, the uh, Superfund law that was designed to identify and clean up uh, severely contaminated sites in, in the nation. And right now, there are about 1,200 different sites that are, are listed on this national priority list. And the rate of cleanup is uh, what I think of as, as moving at a glacial pace. Uh, so about 300 of those sites have been cleaned up. 
Now, uh, recently, the federal government uh, uh, published a report that estimated that the Defense Department and the Interior Department alone uh, uh, are responsible for managing 40,000 uh, severely contaminated sites. So most military bases, most energy facilities, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, the, uh, the former atomic weapons testing areas, uh, these are all severely contaminated sites. And this government report uh, that came out just a few weeks ago estimated that the cost of cleanup of those contaminated sites uh, is now approaching one half trillion dollars. Uh, the Superfund law uh, was funded by Congress and a tax on certain industries, uh, and Congress has allowed that tax to expire. Uh, and now the Superfund uh, uh, is actually uh, empty. There, there is no funding uh, other than funding that's allocated specifically by Congress uh, to federal agencies to go out and, and clean up these messes. So I'm going to give you one example of, of this problem. Uh, on a site that I've been working on for the past three or four years uh, down in Puerto Rico, this is a former military base, the uh, Roosevelt Roads uh, Naval Air Station uh, off the east end of Puerto Rico. Uh, Vieques Island, a little island. It's uh, one of the Spanish Virgin Islands here, uh, about 23 miles long and about uh, five miles wide. And in 1940 or 41, uh, uh, following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the, uh, the government decided that uh, they better not concentrate their naval fleet in, in one area. Uh, so they were looking for bases in other parts of the world. And they chose uh, the east end of Puerto Rico as, as uh, a good site. Uh, because it would give them access to the South Atlantic uh, as well as uh, provide a, a safe harbor for the British fleet, which was experiencing increasing uh, uh, pressure from the Germans. So this became uh, the largest military base uh, in the Atlantic, uh, and it also became a center for storage of, of weapons. Uh, some 250 different types of weapons uh, had been stored there, and these have included uh, atomic weapons and 2,000-pound uh, uh, bombs. And <clears throat> the, the population that lived in the area was, was moved out of the area and uh, uh, dislocated uh, to the center part of the island. You can see that somewhat uh, by the development in, in the uh, core center area on the north. Uh, and then the eastern part of the island was heavily bombed so that uh, uh, intense military activities occurred there. And this, raised, uh, this raises a, a very interesting problem. Just uh, several months ago, it was declared by the governor of Puerto Rico to be a Superfund site. Every, every governor has the capacity to identify one site in their state to become a Superfund site that does not have to go through EPA's purview. Uh, so it is now a Superfund site. So I got involved in this uh, predominantly because uh, people mentioned to me that the children on the island were experiencing a high level of certain adverse health effects, asthma, hypertension, uh, and a higher incidence of certain forms of cancer, including neuroblastoma. Uh, so the question uh, that uh, I'm facing now is, well, is the Navy in any way associated uh, with exposures that might have led to these kinds of health outcomes? It turns out to be a very complicated issue. One of the key questions is, well, what did the Navy dump on the island? Uh, going back and, and piecing together material uh, over time, I found that uh, about 150 million pounds of, of bombs or, or other uh, weapons have been dropped on this island uh, since 1945. And uh, the damage to the island has also included uh, disruption of coastal ecosystems, cutting down uh, mangrove lagoons, uh, plowing down uh, sand dunes, and, and uh, allowing seawater to, to wash in, uh, and also to disrupt certain endangered and threatened species sites uh, for manatees, pelicans, and uh, three different species of endangered sea turtles that nest right on the beach. And here's an example of uh, a naval uh, maneuver. And uh, uh, the Navy would uh, often bring uh, uh, 30 or 40 ships. And this became a center for, for uh, NATO operations and training exercises. And uh, up until uh, 2003, uh, very intense operations were, were staged here. So that before uh, 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 the Navy would uh, uh, go to Vietnam or to the uh, uh, first Gulf War, uh, or even the Iraq War, the training for it uh, was commonly centered uh, right here. One example of uh, a problem that uh, remains is the USS Killen. And uh, uh, I've been writing about uh, radioactive waste and, and uh, its mismanagement. And uh, just happened to stumble across the, the uh, fact that the Killen uh, was used as a target ship for uh, naval bombing. So planes would fly over the ship, 
uh, off of Puerto Rico. It turns out it has a uh, kind of a, a long and, and interesting history. It was part of the atmospheric atomic weapons testing program in the Marshall Islands uh, during the mid-1950s. And here, here's actually a, a shot of uh, Operation Hardtack that include two different blasts. So that, that ship, the, uh, the Killen, had an atomic weapon uh, exploded beneath it uh, and one above it and uh, became radioactive. And uh, because uh, the Navy didn't really know what to do with these uh, radioactive hulks that uh, didn't sink, uh, they started dispersing them. Some went to California, and, and uh, some r remain in, in San Diego and San Francisco and, and shipyards. But one was dragged through the Panama Canal and off the east end of Puerto Rico, uh, and then used for training practices until uh, the mid-1990s when, when it was sunk. And now the, uh, uh, <coughs> nobody's really certain what uh, the level of contamination is that it's giving off. Uh, but it has a variety of different problems associated with it, including fuels and other toxic substances that, that uh, most uh, of these, of these uh, ships contain. Uh, but it also is interesting in that uh, uh, about uh, six months ago, I was diving uh, over, over the site uh, where this, this ship is lying on the bottom. And, and uh, it has barrels of uh, unknown substances that are, are leaking. Uh, it has a variety of weapons, uh, bombs that are as long as this table lying next to it that didn't explode. Uh, and when the Navy flyers flew over the island and dropped their bombs, uh, approximately 50% of them didn't hit their target. Uh, they were either too short or too far, uh, which means that the ocean is littered with this uh, uh, storage of unexploded ordnance uh, that's now rusting out, leaking into the environment. Because fish are the uh, predominant source of protein for many of the islanders, uh, one of the interesting questions is, could those uh, contaminants have moved into the food chain uh, and into the fish and into the dinner tables of the Via Kenzi population and into their bodies. Uh, so you can see that uh, it's, it's setting up a, a kind of a very interesting but a very difficult scientific problem to understand whether or not these uh, naval activities might have affected uh, the population and what the route of exposure is. Uh, there are three main routes of exposure that one worries about in my field. Uh, one is inhalation, uh, another is ingestion by food or, or water or I mentioned earlier hand to mouth movement. Uh, and then the other is dermal uptake. And uh, depending upon the chemical and depending upon uh, its form and uh, its formulation, uh, you can get some significant exposures to chemicals uh, by all three of these routes. Cosmetics is a good example of that. You don't think that cosmetics are going to get into your bloodstream, uh, but many cosmetics are detectable or, or compounds that are within the cosmetics are detectable in, in uh, human tissues and, and uh, move through your, your uh, bloodstream because of rapid dermal transfer. Uh, so that the Navy uh, also was, was experimenting with biological and chemical agents. Uh, they weren't just doing this, by the way, at VA case. They were doing this uh, in many different parts of the, of the country and, and the world uh, so that they would spray fuels on the landscape. They would ignite those fuels, and then they would try the effectiveness or, or test the effectiveness of a variety of different flame retardants to put, put out to, uh, uh, the fires. And many of these compounds now are detectable in underlying groundwater sources, and they create an enormously expensive uh, cleanup problem. Um, so how do you, how do you take a, uh, a cubic meter of soil, and how do you rid it of, of uh, say, the, uh, uh, a flame retardant or uh, benzene that comes from fuel? It's a very expensive process, and I'll talk about that in another case in just a moment. When you walk across this island today, uh, there are about 150 to 175 different types of ordnance. Uh, some of these bombs exploded and others did not. Uh, when I go down to my research site, uh, there are some areas that I can't go into unless I have uh, Navy SEALs uh, accompany me that uh, uh, tell me you know, where I should hop, hop step across uh, bombs. And, and some are quite visible, some are not. <clears throat> what, what's in a bomb? It's a pretty in, uh, a nasty mixture of chemicals. Some of these uh, you'll recognize as toxic. Uh, lead, uh, uh, mercury, for example, but also explosives such as RDX uh, or, <coughs> or uh, TNT. By the way, the detection capacity for these compounds now in, in mixtures that are, are commonly parts of, of weapons has gotten extremely sensitive since 9-11. Uh, so that the airport uh, technology, when you walk through the screening uh, area and you see them pull out their little uh, cloth and they wipe your, your uh, suitcase, uh, then they put the, the cloth into a uh, device that, that uh, will give them a reading quickly. Uh, these are, these are uh, capable of detecting some of these compounds in the part per trillion level. 
So that, that history of, of detection sensitivity dropping uh, is a very interesting case. So that in many cases uh, in my field, you find over time as this detection sensitivity uh, uh, improves and, and you can find the chemicals at lower and lower levels, it, it changes your image of, of what's polluted and what's not. Uh, formerly, you would have thought that an area was clean because you weren't capable of detecting it at a low enough level. So you go back into that environment with a sensitive technology and you say, my gosh, this stuff is actually moving uh, in ways that we just did not predict in, in uh, previous time. Who here knows what chaff is? Not separating the wheat from the chaff, but uh, what is dropped out of military aircraft uh, during exercises like this and, and actual combat missions. These are thin strands of fiberglass uh, that formerly had lead uh, embedded within them as well as aluminum. And they're designed to uh, uh, basically uh, mask uh, military activities and, and maneuvers uh, because they, they block radar. Uh, so the, the military was dumping uh, this lead and, and uh, aluminum and fiberglass, uh, these groups of fibers, uh, over, over the island for uh, decades. By the way, they do it over other parts of the nation as well. Uh, without warning people, without telling people to go inside, uh, and without testing whether or not uh, uh, significant amounts are actually reaching the surface, uh, and then what happens to it. Where does it, where does it go once it does reach the surface? Uh, this gives you a sense of what the uh, east end of the island uh, looked like several years ago. Uh, and you find these pockmarked <coughs> uh, holes. Uh, when a bomb explodes, uh, it basically uh, uh, blows into billions of fragments. Uh, that get imploded into the side of a crater. Uh, then these craters, I think I might have another shot here, of, uh, then these craters uh, may fill up with water. And uh, that, uh, that, this is an interesting part of the story because what I've learned from this is that uh, these become uh, toxic soups of, of, of sort. Uh, and during periods of very high rain, uh, tropical storms, hurricanes, you can get a lot of water uh, over, these, uh, over this island in a short period of time. Last fall, uh, uh, Tropical Storm Jean hung over the island for 48 hours and dropped 23 inches of rain in that period. Uh, I was down there the next week and saw this entire area uh, turn into a lake, overflow the mango lagoons, and, and drain into the adjacent coastal waters, uh, which are also favorite fishing grounds for the Via Kenze. Another example of, of some of the problems, some of the danger here associated with uh, uh, research in the area. Uh, it's getting worse, too, because nitrogen is a significant compo component of many bombs. Uh, and nitrogen, as you know, is also a fertilizer. Uh, so once the bombing stopped and these plants uh, stopped getting blown to smithereens, uh, the area has become lush with vegetation. Uh, and nobody has gone down there yet to try to figure out whether or not the different species are absorbing the, the uh, materials, which materials at different rates. Uh, but uh, the, just the, the, the presence of the vegetation makes visibility difficult and uh, the entire uh, practice uh, uh, more dangerous. Uh, one example of, of uh, the bomb, bomb, some of the bombs that uh, we found beneath the surface, uh, wondering uh, what their process of, of degradation is and how they might be leaking stuff into the environment and then what might happen to it. By the way, uh, oh, here's, a, here's an example. Uh, of the same site and that uh, bomb runway that I showed you. And uh, here you can see the, the lagoon uh, that uh, if this were more refined, it's, it's pockmarked. And this is the area where the, the uh, lagoon is running off into uh, this bay, Bahia uh, del Sur. And uh, <coughs> this is, uh, these are seagrass beds that happen to be favorite habitat uh, for some feces, species of fish that are very, very much uh, loved by the Via Kenzies, including uh, conch. Uh, so conch stews, uh, a, a kind of a, a base uh, for their bouillabaisse. base. Uh, they're very common components of the Via Kenzie's diet, uh, as well as uh, other, other species such as uh, uh, snapper, the yellowtail snapper, uh, which is blue with this uh, yellow streak on it, and uh, that, are, that are also uh, heavily consumed by the Via Kenzie. So I'm interested in uh, what was dropped, where and when, where it might have migrated, how it might have moved through the food chain, uh, and <clears throat> into the fish markets or, or into the uh, uh, dinners of, of the population, and then what that might uh, mean in terms of their health effects. So uh, we're, uh, a group of us are mounting a fairly significant long-term project. Trying to figure out uh, fish contamination is a very difficult thing, and many of you have probably heard about methylmercury in fish and how you should uh, be careful of your tuna uh, fish intake. Well, you need to be careful of a lot more than tuna fish. Uh, you need to be careful of... of uh, 
any large uh, predatory fish that sits high in the food chain that has the capacity to uh, build up chemicals that uh, it would include mercury, uh, include other metals, include other chlorinated uh, uh, compounds such as pesticides or, or solvents or PCBs, so that the older the fish, uh, the more contaminated it would be. Uh, but in terms of our study, we're trying to fi figure out uh, what chemicals might have gotten into the fish that the Via Kenzi population eat, uh, so that uh, because it costs us $200 to test each individual fish to put this puzzle together, uh, and we need large sample sizes, uh, we have to be very careful to know the habitat of the fish, whether or not they might spend a good portion of their life cycle in close proximity to the island uh, as a basis for selecting our, our, uh, our sampling. So <clears throat> uh, just a piece of advice for you. Uh, I give this to everybody that I talk to about this project. Uh, my children don't eat tuna fish uh, because of the mercury content. Mercury is uh, especially bad for the developing central nervous system. Uh, and most tuna fish have mercury. Uh, most swordfish has, has mercury in it. Uh, so if you want to uh, enjoy fish and you want to, uh, to uh, avoid uh, these contaminants, uh, I recommend eating very low on the food chain. Uh, so eat uh, young fish, uh, small fish, uh, non-predatory fish, uh, and uh, scallops and uh, shrimp are, are good examples of that, uh, or scrod uh, when, it was, when it was available. Uh, disease incidence on the island is uh, very uh, uh, significantly elevated uh, above disease incidence uh, on the main island of Puerto Rico, and also in comparison to a uh, group of similarly aged uh, uh, Hispanic Americans. Uh, so understanding the relationship between these specific contaminants and these specific illnesses is quite a puzzle. We are, are not even close to being able to make a claim about uh, uh, the pattern of exposure that occurred and uh, whether or not uh, uh, there's responsibility on the Navy's part. So uh, this is the kind of research that uh, I've, I've tended to look at uh, to try to understand the magnitude of, of contaminant released to the environment. Uh, where does a contaminant go once it's released? Uh, how does it lead to a pattern of exposure via inhalation, ingestion, or, or dermal exposure? Uh, and what illnesses might be associated with it? Uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, it's pretty clear that it's going to cost the Navy a terrific amount of money uh, in order to clean this site up. Estimates are in the range now of, of four to eight billion dollars. Uh, and again, remember, this is one of 20,000 different defense sites that are hazardous facilities. Uh, the, the capacity of chemicals to move long distances uh, from their point of release uh, is strong. Uh, studies of pesticides in California, for example, have found uh, that pesticides applied with radioactive tracers uh, have sometimes been detected uh, in underground water supplies uh, four and five miles from their source. Yes? Well, the uh, half-life of the compounds are extremely short that they would, that they would use. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, government, at least, believes that the, the health risk from doing that is uh, negligible. Uh, and it's uh, far more likely to provide uh, scientific insight in uh, how chemicals move into environments that, uh, uh, where the chemical uh, agent itself, like the active pesticide ingredient, uh, would be the toxin of concern. Same principle would apply to the use of radioacti uh, radioactive tracers uh, for, for human health diagnosis. Uh, we've also begun tissue testing among uh, uh, via Kenze and found that uh, uh, many do have elevated levels of some of the contaminants that uh, you, or some of the compounds that you find in the bombs. Uh, so we're beginning to think about how you could piece together an approach to understand whether or not the mixture of chemicals released by the Navy uh, might also be found in the same or, or within fish that are heavily consumed by the via Kenze, and uh, then whether or not uh, uh, the tissue samples themselves might, uh, might contain a similar uh, group of chem chemicals. Yes? For my students' benefit, could you identify those metals? Oh, sure. Uh, that acetine at the bottom? Uh, aluminum is on the top. Uh, aluminum is a very significant component of most weapons. Uh, lead is next. Uh, cadmium is next. Um, mercury uh, is HG, and arsenic is AS. So uh, most of these are extremely known toxins, uh, other than aluminum. And uh, 
they are, the uh, toxicology has been quite well worked out, and you certainly uh, want to avoid these if, if you can. We're also finding that uh, individual children often have elevated levels of groups of these compounds. So here's another uh, research strategy to think about uh, whether or not uh, your population has, uh, how many in your population has an elevated level of a, of a toxic substance. That's one question. This question is uh, how, many ch how many children would have an elevated level of more than one compound. So here you see that uh, on the right-hand side over here that uh, you've got uh, cadmium, lead, arsenic and aluminum that's elevated to about uh, 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 above a, a reference range. Uh, by the way, uh, the reference range here is specific to each individual chemical. And you've got about 10% of the population that was sampled uh, with these elevated levels. So this is enough uh, evidence to, to say that it's worth additional research to try to figure out uh, whether or not uh, these compounds actually had their origin in the, in the naval activities. Uh, now I want to uh, take you to Cape Cod. Uh, Cape Cod uh, has the Massachusetts Military Reservation that has a very similar history of having been a center for training and, and bombing activity. Uh, and you may not know it, uh, but uh, this military reservation was found to be heavily contaminated. And uh, Cape Cod is, is a very interesting area uh, because uh, geologically it's basically a big sand pile. Uh, and the sand pile has within it an aquifer. Uh, and this is uh, an aquifer that is quite famous. It's called a sole source aquifer. Uh, and gets a special degree of regulation under environmental law uh, so that this entire uh, area on the, the uh, Cape is serviced by this one aquifer. It means it's all connected. Uh, and it also means that chemicals could flow easily uh, uh, within this area. Now, the Massachusetts Military Reservation uh, was located right here. It's still active. In fact, that's the, uh, the reservation uh, where the National Guard jets were, were, were uh, 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 flown to try to intercept the, uh, the hijacked aircraft in, in, on 9-11. Uh, and <clears throat> the intensity of cleanup at this site is really uh, quite extraordinary. So uh, I'd like you to think about this in comparison to the VA case story. So that uh, in, in, uh, uh, on the Massachusetts Military Reservation since 1993, uh, 3,000 pounds of solvents have been removed from this water supply, 1,000 pounds of fuel that had been dumped, by the way, at most, uh, uh, most military sites and uh, at most airports, uh, it's been very common for aircraft to pull into one area and uh, to check the drain valves on their fuel tanks simply by opening them up and making sure that they leak in case uh, they had to dump fuel in an emergency situation uh, so that they would redu reduce the potential for an explosion if uh, they had a, a crash landing. Uh, so that there are sites that are heavily contaminated by jet fuel uh, which is a pretty nasty mixture of, of toxic substances. So they're trying to figure out how to get this jet fuel uh, out of the water supply, and they've mapped out these underground plumes. They have more than 5,000 wells that they had to sink down into the, the, the sandy area to try to figure out uh, the, the movement of, of, of water as well as the contaminants, uh, and also to continually monitor the concentration of a variety of, of, of chemicals, including pesticides and solvents, uh, degreasing agents uh, used on aircraft engines uh, in an attempt to try to, to understand if their pumping activity and their filtration activity was making any, any uh, progress. Uh, and this, uh, this slide uh, demonstrates that they are making progress. Uh, so far, uh, they have uh, 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 expended close to $300 million in their cleanup efforts. Uh, they are pumping out uh, hundreds of millions of, of gallons of water uh, from the, the underlying aquifer uh, every month and pumping them through these large carbon filters. Uh, I was there with my Yale class uh, just uh, two weeks ago showing them the site. And these filters are almost as high as this auditorium is. Uh, and the carbon basically uh, uh, attracts the, the contaminants. That they stick to it. Uh, and then when they test the water at the base of the tank and it, it exceeds a certain uh, threshold, they know that uh, the absorptive capacity is, is uh, uh, gone too low. They have to, to uh, get rid of the carbon. Uh, so that uh, they have warehouses filled with these uh, carbon tanks uh, to pump uh, these billions of gallons per year of water through it uh, at this cost of $250 billion. Uh, so that uh, excuse me, $250 million. 
Uh, so one could think about this as an environmental justice case. I tend to think of it like that, uh, in that you had this very poor population in VA case uh, that uh, basically had a similar type of military history associated with it. They've received no cleanup dollars at all. Uh, and you have this other air base in Massachusetts uh, that has a Senator Kennedy and a, a Senator Kerry uh, that are very effective in getting funds to the Cape Cod community uh, to clean it up, as well as to provide bottled water, drinking water, to communities uh, that, that formerly drank the water coming out of, of this, this area. Yes? The question is, what do they do with the, the, uh, the carbon once it's uh, uh, been, been uh, contaminated? Uh, and the answer is they, they recycle it. And I don't know what the process is, uh, but they, there's a company that uh, does the recycling and uh, then it can come back to them. Uh, what I don't know is where the contaminants eventually end up. And I think that's a, a pretty good question. OK, <clears throat> so that, that's land. I'm going to scoot through a couple of uh, other cases quickly here. Uh, uh, and I just want to leave you with my impression that our, our uh, intense contamination of landscapes is going to be haunting us uh, for probably hundreds of years. And with respect to land, uh, even, even if the government uh, does nothing, uh, trees, vegetation will eventually come back, wildlife will come back into an area. Uh, and unless you are an historian, when you go about uh, the process of buying land or, or deciding where to live, uh, you, could, uh, you could make a very big mistake. In other words, <laughs> when you are thinking about where to live, uh, where to work, uh, I encourage you to think like an historian. Uh, the majority of, of Americans uh, now live within several miles of an uh, intensely contaminated site. Yes? I think not, and it's because of a provision that we have in the, the uh, uh, Superfund law that, that requires an accounting of where those chemicals go. I don't know what happens to them, uh, but I do not believe that they are uh, just dumped out in somebody else's uh, back 40. Yeah. OK, now I want to switch gears a bit, and uh, yes? Do we live near any contaminated sites? Uh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Every town has a sanitary landfill, uh, and I think of that as being one of the uh, great oxymorons uh, that uh, is in our language. Uh, what's sanitary about a landfill? Uh, not much. And uh, you know, before about 1990, uh, lots of nasty stuff was dumped into landfills uh, around the world, uh, around the country, uh, uh, before they were more heavily regulated. And many of these landfills are now closed. And I live in a town, as an example, that, uh, where the, the town's old landfill uh, was transformed into a housing development. And <clears throat> parts of it were so contaminated that they, they transformed that into a land trust because the town didn't really want uh, the land to be sold, so they took it over. And <clears throat> so now you, you, you see a sign that says land trust. Uh, but if you look very carefully, I take my students to the site and uh, ask them to, to uh, tell me what the history of the site was. If you look really carefully, you can see these, these white pipes occasionally sticking out of the field. But uh, otherwise, it looks like this beautiful uh, you know, uh, uh, trust, land trust uh, area, wildlife, deer, turkeys running through it, uh, and uh, the drinking water and, and the, uh, that comes from the wells that were sunk in the vicinity of it were found to be contaminated by a variety of, of chemicals that had leached their way down through the, uh, the water. Uh, I could tell you a lot about Connecticut's water. I, I just uh, finished a, a project on Connecticut's water supply. And uh, uh, I'll just give you the short answer here. Uh, do, not, uh, do not trust uh, uh, well water. Have your well water tested. The Safe Drinking Water Act does not uh, uh, cover wells that serve fewer than 25 people or 16 households. Uh, and there are only 
some 93 different uh, chemical contaminants on the safe drinking water list. That means the government is only required to look for those 93, whereas there are tens of thousands of hazardous chemicals that are re released to the environment. So there's a good example of, uh, you know, many people have the expectation that we have this complex body of law that is health protective. Uh, but if you're not even looking for a variety of contaminants, including most pesticides that are not listed uh, and, and not, not sought uh, in these water supplies, uh, then you can't uh, you can't have a uh, you have a false sense of security is what I'm suggesting. Yes. Which town has that? Uh, Killingworth. Killingworth. Yeah. But I would I would guess that uh, many towns are the same. By the way, it's very common for uh, old hazardous waste sites to be translated uh, into preserves of one sort or another, and um, in in uh, uh, another uh, uh, example of uh, congressional wisdom. Uh, the east end of uh, Vieques, the most heavily bombed out area, was just uh, turned over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a wildlife refuge, uh, as many hazardous military facilities have also been. And it also was declared to be a federal wilderness area. So that pockmarked, uh, highly contaminated landscape is, uh, as of two years ago, now part of our national federal wilderness system. Uh, the logic being, well, if we call it wilderness, then we can uh, use regulatory authority to keep people out and uh, thereby prevent their exposure. And if we can keep people out and prevent their exposure, then maybe we can get away with not having to clean it up. I want to talk about malaria. And uh, this is a very different kind of a problem. And uh, this is probably the last case that I'll be able to go through, but I'll go through it quickly. Uh, many in this country uh, do not think that, that uh, uh, we face risks of, of vector-borne disease. Uh, and if you look at uh, our environmental laws, uh, they're predominantly designed to control our exposure to synthetic chemicals, many of which were produced in the 20th century. But if you place yourself in a low-income situation, such as, as Africa, uh, uh, moist uh, uh, tropical Africa, uh, you find a very different matrix of, of risk. Uh, so what I'm suggesting here is we have the luxury in high-income nations to worry about synthetic chemical contamination and, and those risks, uh, whereas many in the world face far more serious risks uh, from biological agents. Uh, malaria is a, a disease that's been an enormous killer uh, throughout human history. Uh, there are 300 to 500 million clinically disabled people worldwide 40% of the world's population is at risk, uh, and 90% of the malaria incidence and mortality, uh, mortality means death, uh, that occurs in Africa. Uh, it's treatable, it's preventable, uh, but they don't have the money to manage it. About 1.5 million people are now estimated by the World Health Organization to die of this illness every year, uh, and 80% of these are children uh, and pregnant women, pregnant women because of their reduced immunity. So there's one death due to this illness uh, in the world every 30 seconds. And uh, uh, I wrote a book uh, that included a chapter on malaria several years ago. And uh, uh, the research I did for the book uh, led me to conclude that 250 million people have died of malaria during the 20th century. And if you add up all of the people that died due to the direct effects of warfare during the 20th century, uh, most military historians do not get above about 150 million. So this gives you some sense of the, of the scale of, of, of this kind of a problem. Uh, the population at risk uh, is predominantly in these nations. Uh, there's about $200 million expended every year to try to control malaria. Uh, and the estimates of loss in gross domestic product or gross uh, economic activity uh, of nations where this is endemic is about $12 billion. And this illness consumes about 40% of all money that is spent to uh, control public health or improve public health in, in Africa. Malaria is not the only uh, serious vector-borne disease uh, transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, the the uh, uh, illness known as dengue also is endemic in, in Africa and parts of, of Latin America. And uh, one of the bad parts about this story is that uh, many of the insects that carry these diseases uh, Anopheles uh, uh, mosquitoes carry malaria. Uh, Aedes aegypti carries uh, uh, dengue. 
they're becoming resistant to a variety of, of uh, the insecticides that are the least costly insecticides. And you may have heard about the debate uh, that went on in the World Health Organization several years ago uh, when the uh, Persistent Organic Pollutant Treaty was being negotiated among nations to try to phase out DDT worldwide. And then African nations uh, uh, argued strenuously for continued access to DDT uh, because it was persistent, it was not acutely toxic, uh, and it was very effective at killing the mosquitoes. And they, all, they had stocks of, uh, of, this, uh, of this compound. Uh, substitutes commonly cost four to eight times more than DDT costs, uh, so that nations that have almost no money uh, are not likely to buy the uh, synthetic pyrethroids that we would spray, say, in the United States uh, for a vector-borne disease problem. Uh, by the way, that treaty was, was passed, uh, and I got a chance to sit on a panel uh, of, of uh, scientists that, that uh, looked at the dangers of DDT uh, compared to the, the dangers of, of malaria. Uh, and we recommended to the, the uh, director of the World Health Organization, uh, Grove Brutland, uh, that uh, the African nations be exempt from any sort of global ban on the use of DDT, uh, despite its persistence, uh, but because of the severe threat faced in these, in these nations. Uh, some of the other key illnesses that uh, you find uh, in the world include uh, the, the uh, uh, encephalitis, uh, cases, uh, St. Louis encephalitis uh, in the orange, West Nile virus that uh, we're now experiencing in uh, the United States. And uh, by the way, West Nile encephalitis was, was found uh, only as, as uh, recently as year 2000. And uh, by year 2004, uh, look at these patterns of incidence. It was found in New York in this area. Uh, and now look at these patterns uh, of, of incidence. Uh, 2,900 people uh, reported cases. And about 300 people per year are now dying of West Nile encephalitis. So this is, uh, this is one of a, a group of emerging infectious diseases uh, that, that uh, uh, had the capacity to, you know, to jump from uh, one area of the world to, to another area of the world. And uh, they create some serious management problems. In our country, we will deal with this in a very different way than the African nations because we have a whole suite of chemicals that we could use that are less persistent than DDT, uh, that are, are less uh, uh, toxic to wildlife, uh, but they are more expensive. Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that uh, you need to worry about the capacity, the institutional capacity to manage risk uh, and the, uh, the disparity in that capacity among many, many different nations. Uh, Lyme disease is another example of a vector-borne disease, uh, a neurodegenerative disease uh, that also has arthritic symptoms. And uh, you should know that we are kind of at, uh, we're at ground zero here. Uh, this disease was, was uh, first discovered by uh, Dr. Stern here at Yale in, in the late 1970s. Uh, and you see also a pattern of spread, mostly to the, uh, the upper Midwest, uh, but uh, with a special concentration here in the, in the east. Uh, here's a, a Connecticut map showing the, uh, the reported cases uh, in 2004. Uh, and it, uh, this represents a serious illness. And there's a, a rise and a, a decline depending upon climatic conditions from year to year. Uh, this year is a very, uh, it's a very bad year for these deer ticks. Uh, so uh, my recommendation is to, to uh, uh, check yourself, check your kids uh, for ticks uh, when you go out into, into the woods. Uh, many of these illnesses are, are transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, they they uh, uh, include uh, uh, parasites, uh, malaria in this case, uh, that is, is uh, taken from an infected, the blood of an infected individual. Uh, the parasite goes through a reproductive stage in the mosquito's stomach. Uh, it actually explodes through the stomach wall and then is inserted uh, down the proboscis uh, as the mosquito bites the next person. Uh, and injects a little bit of, of uh, an anticoagulant to make that next individual bleed. Uh, and when it injects that anticoagulant, that's when the parasites get in, in, uh, ingested to the, to the next person. And that's how an epidemic can, can uh, move ahead. Now, uh, <clears throat> based upon this concern for vector-borne disease, I want to uh, talk just a little bit about pesticides. I had a chance to work with a, a couple of National Academy of Sciences committees on, on pesticides over the past uh, couple of decades. And uh, I just want to give you a sense of the scale of this problem. Uh, there are some 70,000 different chemicals that are registered in the world. Uh, 23,000 of these are registered in the United States. But these compounds are intentionally designed to be toxic substances. Uh, and they create 
significant economic benefits for crop protection, for timber protection. Uh, there are uh, rodenticides to kill rodents. There are algicides. There are slimicides. There are insecticides. There are fungicides. There are herbicides. These are all a class of biocides that uh, were specifically designed to injure cells of one sort or in one species or another. And one of the key mistakes was a presumption on the part of, of the designers uh, that they would be very specific, that they would have the capacity to adversely affect only one species, uh, or perhaps one species uh, at one point in its, in its life cycle. Uh, but the history of science has demonstrated something very different, which is non-specificity. Uh, so that <clears throat> we used to think that a lot of compounds uh, were safe that, uh, for human exposure, when as, whereas uh, uh, the current understanding is, is very different. Um, <clears throat> I want to point to two discoveries uh, at the same time. Uh, one by Ed Logue, working in the Food and Drug Administration, who first found DDT in human milk in 1951. And another, the discovery of iodine-131, produced from atomic weapons explosions, uh, that the Atomic Energy Commission discovered uh, in 1951. Uh, these two histories are extremely uh, similar in that you had uh, uh, the government sponsoring the production of DDT as well as uh, the, the uh, atomic weapons, uh, and the testing of those compounds uh, was quite narrow, allowing their broad-scale introduction uh, to the environment uh, by 1952, the Atomic Energy Commission recognized that uh, uh, the radionuclides were circling the globe. Uh, they were raining down in thunderstorms and uh, uh, settling as dust uh, in different parts of the world. The uh, grasslands in Connecticut were being contaminated by explosions that were occurring in Nevada. Uh, other explosions uh, off of the California coastline. Uh, even the explosions, the large explosions in the Marshall Islands. Uh, where the USS Killen that I showed you was, was part of one of those tests. Uh, so the, the failure to recognize that these compounds could go into global circulation, uh, move long distances, and result in patterns of contamination, and then move back up a food chain was a discovery uh, that we knew in 1951. But throughout the past 50 years, we've repeatedly uh, neglected that history. We have, uh, we have a, a, uh, a learning disability as a society. Uh, we're, not, we're not learning from our past mistakes. Uh, and also, there was a pattern of secrecy that uh, uh, basically prevented uh, many people from uh, the knowledge that uh, uh, iodine-131 was building up in the milk supply. Uh, it was building up in human tissues. Uh, it uh, has the capacity to, to injure your, your thyroid gland. Uh, and by 1955, every human on Earth uh, was known to carry levels of both DDT as well as iodine-131 in their body tissues. Now, this has, uh, this has uh, sparked a whole new scientific approach to understanding uh, what's worth worrying about, because we now know we can look for contaminants in human tissues. Uh, so that uh, experts are now able to find up to 500 different chemicals in human tissues. It may be the hair. Uh, it made, uh, the hair is uh, a good medium to test for a variety of metals, uh, mer methyl mercury as an example. It could be, could be uh, bone. Uh, I've got a colleague, Herb Needleman at the University of Pittsburgh, who uh, basically broke the whole issue about kids' exposure to lead and developed a, a series of subtle cognitive uh, neurological tests to figure out that kids exposed to high levels of lead uh, had uh, more problems with uh, cognition, memory, and learning, uh, and uh, lower IQs. He was the guy that, uh, that discovered that relationship between lead and, and uh, neuro, neurodevelopment. And he did that by testing baby's teeth. He went around and collected baby's teeth from dentists. Uh, other compounds are detectable in the blood, other in the urine. Uh, so 500 different uh, uh, compounds that are potentially toxic are now discoverable. If you went and had every possible test uh, right now, well, that would cost you about $10,000 to do that. Uh, but uh, the average person uh, that has been tested is carrying about uh, between uh, 75 and maybe 125 of these synthetic compounds in one tissue or, or another. Uh, we don't know what this means. Uh, with, with the exception of exposure to just a, a few of these, of these chemicals. Uh, so it's, it's leading to a kind of a whole new way of thinking about uh, what the word contamination means, uh, how much is OK, and uh, you know, where you should set allowable limits in, in, in law. 
I'm going to scoot uh, ahead here and just uh, stop so that uh, uh, you, can, you can tell that I way overshot here on, on what I was going to tell you. Uh, I'll leave you uh, uh, with a couple of thoughts here about the food supply. Uh, this group of, of pesticides is known to get into the food supply. And I've studied uh, kids' diets as a way of trying to understand whether or not uh, their specific dietary patterns could cause them to be exposed to a mixture of, of, of chemicals in, in a way that was more dangerous than others. Uh, and it turns out that they are. Uh, this is a, I, I developed this chart really as a, as a joke when I was playing with uh, some 3D software. And then I realized that uh, it provided the seed for understanding the variability in exposure to, to pesticides that make their way into, into uh, the food supply. Uh, so that this represents the diet of 170 children across their 50 most consumed foods here on the bottom. And what you see here is uh, kind of the, uh, the mountains of uh, orange juice and uh, wheat flour and, and apple juice among, this is one to two year olds, and uh, some uh, kind of uh, foothills of, of sugar over here. And then you see the valleys of uh, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and the foods that you know, kids hate. Uh, but uh, this gave me the idea that, well, you know, why not just be strategic and concentrate the search on the foods that kids eat the most of and then see what chemicals appear on those foods and figure out what the, the risk is from that. Uh, and this, this uh, approach uh, was brought together with residue data. When you go to the grocery store and you buy non-organic food, you're buying food that does have pesticide residues in it. Uh, here's an example where uh, uh, spinach for, for, uh, for one case, uh, or soybeans rather for one case, 90 uh, or 80 percent of the, the samples tested by the, the uh, Food and Drug Administration were found to have residues. So uh, there are these residues out there, uh, often at fairly low levels. Uh, but some of these residues have properties that could allow them to concentrate as foods are translated from their raw form, like apples to apple juice or soybeans to soybean oil, uh, in the same way that uh, the, the uh, uh, DDT or uh, iodine-131 could, could move its way up, uh, up the food chain. So <clears throat> here's a group of organophosphate insecticides that the government has allowed to exist uh, and, and use in the food supply. And uh, it's, this is a relative ranking of their toxicity. So, uh, and demonstrated by this list of chemicals here on the uh, left-hand side. So trying to figure out where the chemicals are most often uh, present in which foods, uh, and which foods uh, kids eat the most of, it provides a, it provides a way of, of trying to uh, uh, strategically direct government's attention. Uh, to the most consumed foods, uh, the, the, the chemicals that have the highest degree of toxicity, and uh, also the, the uh, foods where residues commonly appear. Some, some pesticides are used on crops and they don't appear. Uh, they have a rapid degradation rate. Uh, but uh, getting the government to be strategic about how it spends its scarce time and to focus on susceptible populations has been, a, uh, uh, I think, a major challenge. Uh, what's worth worrying about with respect to pesticides? I worry a lot about indoor exposures. Uh, I've worked on a number of different uh, indoor contamination and uh, uh, illness cases and uh, now know that, that uh, when you spray pesticides indoors, uh, you're going to be exposed at a level far higher than you would to the same pesticide that might be allowed to be used in the food supply. So uh, your exposure comes in all three routes uh, by uh, inhalation and, and dermal uptake. Uh, as, as well as ingestion. Uh, so uh, if you want to uh, you know, protect yourself, think about uh, reducing the, uh, your importation of hazardous chemicals such as pesticides into your indoor environment. I'm going to scoot down here to just a closing slide. I was going to take you through a diesel bus study that we did that, that uh, found that uh, school buses are extremely dirty environments. Uh, and I'll stop here with uh, just a couple of key lessons. Uh, one key lesson that I want to leave you with is that there's variable susceptibility in the population. Uh, this can vary by age or by pattern of exposure or by gender or ethnicity or, or your location. Do you live in close proximity to a hazardous facility? Uh, it also uh, 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 is important to think about what quality of surveillance we have ongoing. In other words, uh, how many foods are actually sampled by the government to figure out if they are contaminated? It turns out remarkably few. Uh, 13,000 samples per year in FDA. Anybody want to guess how many different pieces of food are sold in the United States every year? Maybe 100 trillion? 
100 trillion, 13,000 samples, uh, when you've got 100 trillion different uh, pieces of, of food that uh, might have uh, some, some residue in it. I mean, my reaction to that as somebody that worries a lot about sampling design is, why bother? Uh, it's, it's not giving you any assurance that the food supply is safe. Uh, secrecy, ownership of, uh, of information is critical here. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, uh, the Administrative uh, Procedures Act, uh, several other statutes that I talked about earlier, uh, they're, they're very important statutes because they allow you to ask the government information. Uh, so uh, you, you have a greater right to know than you used to have in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, but the government also is not monitoring at a level that you would feel secure about. Uh, so you have the right to ask them the question, uh, but they're likely to come back to you and say, we didn't test, we don't know. Uh, ethical standards for decision making. Uh, you know, the, uh, the VA case and the Massachusetts case uh, 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 cases tell me that, uh, you know, the value of precaution is high. We could save a lot of money by being more precautionary in the way that we manage our environment, the way we, we manage chemical release. Uh, our technology dispersion and, and uh, most products are now distributed globally uh, so that uh, we have the problem not only of managing our, our environment and toxic substances within our national boundaries, but also this transboundary flow of goods and, and services uh, is distributing risks that unless you have a good surveillance system set up, good testing at the borders, you're not going to find. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, down here uh, to, to uh, my own conclusion as well that uh, EPA's website, if you go to EPA's website, uh, they will claim that uh, the environment is much cleaner than it was uh, when uh, uh, they, they were begun in 1970. And I would argue uh, any conclusion about whether or not uh, we're safer today than we were uh, when uh, these laws uh, were originally passed uh, depends very much upon uh, what you choose to measure uh, so that uh, uh, don't be lured into a false sense of security. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and just entertain any questions that you have. Yes? Can you please just go back to fish for a moment? Sure. You did mention salmon. And would that allow farm-raised and wild? Okay. Yeah, the, the uh, farm-raised uh, issue, I think, is uh, it's very interesting. And there are a bunch of problems that are, are uh, emerging with respect to, to uh, uh, fisheries cultivation. And they have to do with bacteria. They have to do with uh, chemical contamination. Uh, they have to do with uh, the potential for buildup of contaminants in feed that's fed to the fish. Um, and uh, also salmon, I mean, most uh, farm-raised salmon is, is uh, colored. Uh, so that uh, the, the grocery stores can actually choose which color salmon they want. There's a color fan that goes from kind of a very dark pink to a very light pink. Uh, so they want their salmon to look like wild salmon, uh, which is naturally pink. Uh, so that uh, and, uh, marketing surveys have demonstrated what people like. So that uh, uh, they don't like to buy uh, gray salmon, which is the way that farm-raised salmon uh, turn out, unless you feed them this artificial flavor, or artificial color, excuse me. I think that uh, uh, salmon tends not to absorb the contaminants uh, that I described uh, to the level of swordfish and, and uh, some of the other large predators, uh, right, wild salmon. Uh, but uh, there are some contaminants. But on a, uh, if you were to, to rank the, uh, the, the relative contamination of different species, uh, they'd be closer to the bottom. Yes? Can you comment on the purity of commercial bottled water? Huh. The Safe Drinking Water Act applies to bottled water, um, but it applies only to bottled water that's transported across state boundaries. Uh, so that if you wanted to set up your own marketing scheme here in Connecticut, uh, you could go and uh, get some bottles and uh, uh, fill, it up, fill them up with a hose in, in the garage and uh, probably make some serious money. Uh, Yale has started to uh, sell its own bottled water, as, as an example. There's, there's Yale water. Um, so that uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act requirements are uh, applicable to a company like Poland Spring. I think that's what you had. Uh, uh, to Avion. And uh, what that means is that, that uh, uh, those 93 contaminants that are on the Safe Drinking Water maximum contaminant level list are, are, uh, are they're looked for during their sampling efforts. Uh, the sampling uh, efforts are not always trusted by companies like Poland Spring. So they will go through their own filtration process. Uh, and uh, some companies take the minerals out through filtration and treatment, and uh, then they actually add some minerals back in uh, to adjust the taste. 
Uh, so there, there is a lot of variability. There, there was a good study by the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, that you can find on their website that compared brands of, of bottled water uh, and which ones uh, had higher contaminants than, than others. Yes? I always wondered with bottled water, wasn't the softer and plastic tubing in water? Uh, yes. I mean, in some cases, it depends upon the plastic. And uh, the softer plastics uh, are more likely to leach. Uh, and it's kind of impossible for you to know what chemicals are leaching into what kinds of foods, because there could be variability depending upon acidity uh, or other, uh, the other uh, chemicals in the, in the food. And I think that uh, uh, I try to avoid plastic uh, as, a, as a container for food. It's a, it's a really hard thing to do these days, as you know. Even cans, are, are cans and milk cartons are lined with plastic. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you can use glass as a container, I, I think that that's safer. Uh, plasticizing agents uh, such as uh, bisphenol A have uh, been found in, in uh, human tissues. I have a slide of that that I could have showed to you. Uh, so that uh, the softer the chemical, uh, so softer the plastic, I think that the higher the chance that it would migrate. Uh, in my family, we do not uh, microwave things in plastic. Um, uh, because uh, that uh, has been shown in some cases to increase the, the rate of migration uh, to the food. Other questions? Yes? Ooh, that's a tough question. Uh, the one thing they could do. What, what could you do? What was the one thing you could do to, uh, uh, to best protect themselves or best? Uh, well, to help change things in a positive direction. What can they do in an active way, proactively? What is the one thing at their age that they can start to do proactively? Well, there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot that you can learn uh, uh, by uh, uh, going on the internet, if you wanted to know what the most uh, dangerous air contaminants were, the most dangerous uh, drinking water contaminants. There's also a lot of good advice out there about how to reduce your exposure to air pollutants, food contaminants, drinking water contaminants. Uh, uh, my wife and I wrote a, a, a brochure about that, uh, how to reduce your, your, uh, your exposure to a, a variety of different uh, environmental health risks. You know, part, part of the problem here is uh, there are many different kinds of contaminants. And uh, at, at the root uh, of the problem is an absence of basic literacy uh, on the part of the public and an absence of, of uh, ecological thinking. Uh, part of the problem of environmental uh, management uh, to reduce chemical exposures is that these chemicals are commonly not detectable by human senses. Uh, so that uh, you need to therefore look for proxy indicators. Where might you expect to find them? Well, I mean, people, people do the darndest things. I mean, people with shallow wells and sands and gravel will go out and they'll spray pesticides on their lawns, uh, not thinking that, uh, gee, you know, it, might, it might move from the surface down into the drinking water. Uh, so that, that's, and from my mind, that's an absence of ecological thinking. It's also a, a statement about uh, how the importance of, of green lawns uh, has uh, uh, dominated uh, how people manage their property. Yes? Two things. Do you have or know where you get a, a list of what your well water sh should be tested for? I mean, we have our water tested at a lab in New Haven. They do standard, like, household water tests. And yeah. Is there, like, a specific list for Connecticut that, you know, we really should be checking this and this and see if it matches up with the list that we should have tested for? Well, you, you should definitely test for lead. I mean, lead is the, uh, the, the primary uh, concern. If you, if you lived in an agricultural area or if your house is built in a former agricultural area, as many houses in Connecticut were, uh, it would make sense to, to uh, test for pesticides. If you live in the vicinity of uh, uh, any sort of a fuel supply, such as a gas station or, uh, uh, say, any sort of a corporation that is likely to be storing fuel on its site, uh, then I would test for chemicals commonly found in fuels. Uh, so, uh, you know, benzene and, and uh, other uh, uh, chlorinated compounds. Uh, 
but uh, if you went to most good laboratories in Connecticut and uh, you also thought you know, ecologically about where you live in relationship to other land uses and you thought historically about patterns of land use in your area, that would give you and it would give the, the lab, I think, a pretty good indication of the chemicals to look for. Why don't we uh, wrap this up so that we can talk to the speaker personally, but let's thank the speaker for... Thank you very much. Thank you.